computer science inspired analysis of machine learning is not the most common thing to do, but I hope that by the end of this lecture, you'll be convinced that analysis is super important and it should actually become, in my opinion, uh, is it too, am I speaking too quiet? Could you please? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me well now? All right, I'll, I'll go back to restating that analysis is super important and should become a routine part of the machine learning practice. Um, so, as, as my friend mentioned, um, I've been working for DeepMind for quite a while now, so I've collected quite um, a lot of stories, and um, some of them reached publication level, and some of them got, as they say, swept under the carpet. And we learned from all of them, so you're going to hear... A, biased sample uh, of all of them. All right, but let me beg begin uh, where it all started, which is actually um, in this city, in this very university. And uh, in fact, in this very building, I've been taking classes I will never forget in like number theory. Um, but I, I did not stay in the you know, <laughs> informatics, not because of the number theory. theory. I didn't stay here long. Uh, I finished my master's with a, a physics department. Um, and I did already uh, analyze first um, signals from the brains, which were the EEG signals. And um, so my interest started in um, you know, looking at the uh, evoked activity of voluntary finger movement. And um, then I went on to study orientation tuning and orientation maps um, in Germany. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what orientation tuning is in neurons. Um, and, and then I went on uh, to study olfaction and uh, Bayesian hypothesis of how the brain works um, at University College London. So th this path might... Okay, I ended up in deep mind. This path might uh, look very convoluted, but there, there is a common uh, theme to it, and that is... Sorry. Um, I've been always driven by trying to understand what intelligence is. And initially, it was the intelligence of our um, human brains and the brains of uh, other animals. And, and now it is the investigation of the artificial intelligence. Um, as I already mentioned, this is going to be a lot of stories, so I, I tried to put a structure over it. And I'm going to give you a very gentle intro of what... Oh, sorry. What neuroscience is. Um, and then tell you about the... Uh, initial investigations um, that I did after arriving in DeepMind, so doing very classical neuroscience experiments on the then uh, still very famous DQN. And uh, the, most of my part will be, part of my talk will be about uh, the current method, what we do in, in DeepMind to understand what kind of you know, algorithms we develop. And then um, I'm going to share with you my experience from the most recent projects that I did with the science team um, at DeepMind. All right, so to begin with neuroscience. Neuroscience is uh, recently, sorry, a rather recent um, scientific field that deals with uh, the nervous system, tries to answer the question of how the brain works. And it is recent because it has been mostly enabled by two recent discoveries of bioelectricity and the microscope. Uh, bio, um, bioelectricity um, means basically that uh, uh, the electric current has influence on, on uh, our nervous system. And um, out, out of this initial experiment with a frog where, you know, touching the uh, frog's muscle with an electrode evoked a movement of a muscle that made us realize, hey, uh, electric current is how the brain works, um, that, that grew into the whole field of physiology. And then, um, we, thanks to the microscope, we could zoom in onto the nerves and find out that they're actually built out of uh, very, very tiny... Um, nervous cells called neurons uh, that show an extreme, extreme variety. Um, so, oh God, a lot of different fields contribute to uh, trying to tackle that question of how the brain works. Um, chemistry, mathematics, medicine, um, computer science. Uh, but I, I would rather say that uh, the ever-continuing growth of neuroscience is due to the uh, ever-improving recording techniques. So we now can record not just from single neurons, um, but also uh, from uh, 
less invasively from uh, average uh, signals of the, of the whole populations of neurons uh, using EEG, MEG, optical imaging, or um, other functional imaging. And uh, since recently, we can also record from neurons in parallel. So we have, instead of one electrode, thousands of these uh, very, um, very thin, very fine microelectrode arrays that get stuck uh, directly into the brain and record uh, electric signals directly. And the optogenetics that is making quite a splash in uh, neuroscience. But um, here, a, a short slide on what's the basic method of neuroscience is, and that is to basically take an animal, um, this is a classical experiment by Hubel and Wiesel from uh, like 60 years ago, where, where they would anesthetize this um, poor little cat and keep its eyes open and show oriented stimuli um, and record from the visual cortex. And um, by checking the, the response of the neuron to um, stimuli showing different orientation, and by, by plotting this response um, as a function of the orientation of the stimulus, they, they um, saw that lots of neurons showed this um, nice, smooth, continuous bell-like um, curve. Um, so what, what uh, they called the maximum of this uh, curve, they called preferred orientation of a neuron, and they, they said these neurons are orientation selective. And uh, actually, that discovery continued in all sorts of um, other labs. Why is it not working now? Ah, I'm just going to use this one. Um, so, so we now know about orientation tuning, not just at the level of a single neuron, uh, but also of these um, populations of neurons. So in, in this uh, image, uh, you can... Now let's actually cut a little bit. Um, you can see, um, coded with color, preferred orientations of uh, large populations of neurons um, uh, in the visual cortex. And you can see that uh, nearby neurons or nearby populations share preferred orientation. And uh, that, has been, that has been a topic of like, uh, theoretical and experimental studies in, ac across many uh, different animals and, and uh, moles of um, brain computation. Then when you zoom in into the neurons, you can hear, hear differentiate single neurons. You can see that this nice continuity of mapping preferred orientation uh, applies also at the single level. Um, but why am I telling you this? <laughs> I've been... Uh, uh, I listed basically the base tools of neuroscience and the base uh, method of neuroscience. Um, but the relevant question, question relevant for this room, is how we can use them uh, for understanding artificial intelligence. And in order to address that question, we list basically what, what uh, the question, what these um, tools uh, give us. What kind of um, knowledge do we uh, yield from them? So, um, unfortunately, like a majority of recording techniques um, is about mapping the wiring diagram of the brain. So just checking how each type of neuron connects to each different type of a neuron and probing response occurs of these uh, variety of neurons. Uh, the two things, it's not working for me, are like fully known in AI. We know exactly how the neurons correct because we designed them, and we know exactly how they respond because these are the um, mathematical equations we put in, in our machine learning systems. So, so the more interesting question uh, for us, for relevant for AI, are um, you know, studying function. So the, the type of experiment that I, show, uh, that I exposed on the last slide, uh, where we show the stimulus and record response, which can be either neural activity or behavior. Um, and also, since recently, we can perturb activity and, and see how much that changes the behavior or, or the, um, the function of the system. So um, to step back a little bit and like, uh, 
just, just a side note, if you, this is going to be a lot of stories, so if you pass out, if you relax too much, each time I show you this kind of a slide, just pay attention because it's like a summary slide. So, so a short summary and the message I want to relay here is that in artificial systems, we can focus on, on the really interesting uh, question of understanding intelligence. So we don't have to um, describe the implementation because the implementation is known. Uh, but we have this challenge of trying to ask um, interesting, good questions, answerable questions. And the possibilities are unlimited. Um, and I would claim that the, uh, the impact is of crucial importance. We are on the way uh, to artificial general intelligence, um, which we do want to feel safe around. So understanding how the AGI works, um, what kind of algorithms it develops through our machine learning me methods is super important. But also before we get to that level, to the AGI, we already de delegate a lot of our decisions to machines. And um, we, we want to know, I mean, it is beneficial to know how these decisions are being made. Um, and I would, I would try to convince you that this need is more urgent than understanding the real brain. Um, okay, so starting with um, the stories from like five years ago, when I came with all these neuroscientific tools and uh, joined the company um, at the beginning of you know, the deep learning rush with a, a deep Q learning network still very hot in the news, starting the era of, uh, you know, machine learning, deep learning, uh, reaching AI uh, level. Um, I, I took that deep Q network, put it on the neuroscientific experimental bench, and I showed, like, just like Kubel and Wiesel did, um, I showed the stimuli and I recorded a uh, response. But of course, I wasn't showing the oriented, um, gratings oriented stimuli, but something that felt more relevant for the uh, DKN that was trained to play some of you might have recognized the Space Invaders game. So um, in, in this first investigation, and here at the top you have a uh, picture of the DQN, um, back then still considered a very deep network. It uh, contained only three convolutional layers, one fully connected layer, and then the output layer from which the Q values were read out and from, from which uh, policy was formed. So, so this agent that I analyzed learned to play the Space Invaders very well. And I was interested in how um, the neurons encode, um, or whether they care, whether they compute with, um, with the position of the laser. So the little thing at the bottom that basically targets uh, the aliens and shoots the aliens. And so the, these were the types of stimuli that I was showing. Uh, while recording response uh, of the neurons across the whole DQN network, DQN brain. And sure enough, uh, at every layer of the network, you could see that uh, the neurons that would show uh, selectivity to laser position. And in the first layer, the, the selectivity would be very fine, so the neuron would be um, responding um, with a large amplitude and uh, you know, only to uh, some range of uh, laser positions. And as you went uh, um, down the depth of this um, network, the, uh, or the laser selectivity tuning curves would become broader and broader, and, and then would vanish in the last layer that only had like six outputs. Um, so, sure, we, we have laser selectivity, and we, can, we are not limited uh, by any recording techniques. We can show that selectivity in every single neuron of the network. So what are you looking at here is the response, um, sorry, <sighs> laser selectivity of neurons that are arranged according to their uh, topographical uh, mapping. So, so the neurons that um, uh, are here plotted with blue, meaning that they had low laser selectivity, had the receptive fields focused in the upper left uh, corner of the screen. So sure enough, the sanity check uh, was passed. Most of the neurons that were selective to the laser position were located at the bottom of the screen, so were direct, directly stimulated by the laser moving around. Um, and you can 
plot these images, uh, functional images for the entire uh, convolutional layer. Here, uh, you know, every of these images shows a different feature, a different kernel. And you can check what happens when you uh, rectify the activity of these neurons, and you see that a lot of selectivity vanishes for, for many features. You no longer have um, laser selective neurons. However, when you um, look at the downstream layer, all the selectivity due to pooling information across many neurons is restored. Um, and so on and so on, what can keep plotting these images. But I think it's uh, time to pause and wonder uh, what have we actually learned? So, in, in particular, we've learned about the DQN. It shows um, signs of laser selectivity across all processing layers, and this rectification uh, seems to be destroying the selectivity, but uh, it, it's not like a final destruction because it can get easily restored in, in the downstream layers. And uh, we learned also one, uh, one thing that I didn't mention, which was to uh, basically decide which of the evalu evaluation metrics uh, was best for el evaluating laser selectivity, and that turned out to be mutual information other than, I don't know, signal-to-noise ratios or whatever we tried. All right, so, so now we're going to do a similar thing. That's another experiment in a behaving agent. Um, and that's a side remark. Until recently, neuroscience had to um, put their animals to sleep, and uh, and only recently, um, you know, the, through these complicated setups, they um, they are able to record from awake animals that are tricked into believing that they're moving around in, in some reality world. But uh, we've saved all that, and we've self saved the need uh, to apply for any ethics approvals. We can do with our DKN whatever we want. Um, and so in this case, um, what I was doing here was, um, I think that's a picture that I'm focusing on behavior right now in this um, experiment. And um, the stimuli that I'm showing to my awake uh, DKN are the, um, the aliens at, just showing up a, a different position of the screen, different types of aliens too. And um, from that study, we realized that the DQN that would seem to be very successful and all in the news would not ta um, target the mothership or any aliens that were um, not, not too far from him and would only shoot the um, uh, enemy that would be super close, nearly at the uh, tip of the laser. Um, so yet another thing that we can do with artificial intelligence that is hard to, uh, to do in um, reality, in real life, is that we can uh, you know, expose the network to um, stimuli taken outside of its uh, natural habitat. So um, we can, in this case, we were checking uh, what happens. Normally, the uh, DQN would, sorry, the laser would only be traveling between these these two barriers. Uh, when we took it outside of the barriers, the policy totally collapsed. Uh, the agent was not um, defending itself at all. Um, however, when we took a different agent that actually had a very similar architecture but a different optimization technique, a, a better est estimation of the Q value, um, that agent would be far, far more far-sighted and uh, would know what to do uh, outside of the, um, of the barriers. So, uh, yet again, what have we learned from this exercise? We did learn about the DKN strategy. It seems that it is far more short-sighted than its cause would uh, reflect. And we learned a bit about the generalization, what happens when we take the, our artificial intelligence outside its training regime, uh, what, what happens to the policy. And uh, as a general remark, this method, ethology, is, um, allows us to, so observing behavior in a controlled setting um, can be very informative, um, as allows us to spot deficiencies in our systems, and uh, also allows us to measure capacity for generalization, for making sure that the AI we, we build uh, is safe and is not going to do crazy stuff in uh, circumstances it's never seen before. And it's actually one of the main methods in DeepMind for you know, checking whether the AI that we develop is actually doing what we think or we wanted it to do in a reasonable manner. 
All right, here is an experiment where we combine the two uh, recording from neurons and recording the behavior. And uh, you might recognize this setup from Razvan's talk on Friday. This, this is a joint work we did together um, in, in this continual learning problem where uh, the agent learns to play three different games um, in consecution. And um, the, the main problem addressed here is to try and uh, come up with a learning algorithm that allows or counteracts the catastrophic forgetting, so allows the agents to uh, you know, still be able to play on this first game after you know it's been training on the third game. And so um, the, the team, the continual learning team, came to us and asked, "Oh, can you tell us which network resources are used uh, for each of these games? Um, are, are, is there a lot of flexibility? How much can we squeeze into that network?" And so, um, without thinking much, we used uh, that evaluation metric that I mentioned before, the, uh, and we uh, measured the mutual information between the type of the game and the neural activity. And uh, without getting into too much detail with, with this picture, um, uh, the takeaway is that initially in the first processing layers, uh, you have a lot of neurons that are specific for one game, and then as you go down uh, the processing um, line, so to say, uh, the, the neurons become less and less uh, selective for playing the game. Um, so, so to address the question that we were asked, how much of the resources are dedicated per each game, um, we, we showed a pie chart like that. And um, if you squeeze your eyes and look closely enough, you might realize that I plot here four games rather than the three that the agent was trained. It was meant um, to be like a sanity check, and uh, I wanted to compare what would be the values of the mutual information um, on a totally new game. And turns out that the values were like in distribution, um, not different than the values that uh, one took or one would get from um, you know, measuring um, on the games that the agent knew very well how to play. Um, yes. So, um, um, general point. What started as a sanity check revealed the failure mode of studying uh, selectivity or sensitivity. Some neurons appeared highly selective for a game that was totally unknown to the agent. And so, going back to the orientation tuning story I told you about, in, in which I investigated quite a lot of years of my life, uh, one, one has to ask neuroscientists mainly, um, how useful is orientation, uh, how useful is it to record from all sorts of neurons and all processing layers, um, you know, responses and selectivity to features as simple as orientation. Uh, as orientation. So the, the most important question for us is, you know, what is functionally relevant? Um, yeah, the sum summary of this um, part of my talk is that evaluation needs behavior, um, and selectivity should be treated with caution. Even statistically significant selectivity can be meaningless for function, and we see that not just in neuroscience, but in a lot of machine learning projects. You, you know, you show correlations rather than uh, causal uh, relationships. So, in terms of the tools, ethology and cognitive neuroscience, so the study of behavior can be super informative for understanding our systems. All right, so now a few stories from um, the method we uh, settled upon. Um, so first, like an, um, an antidote to the pessimism that I just shared with you, recording activity in the brains that we build might, be, might make sense, might, can be useful. And that is in, uh, in the, every case where we have uh, interpretable modules, or we have um, um, you know, functionally distinct modules, such as long-term memory that, that we endowed our uh, agents with, and we have some expectations from them. Visualizing from them can be useful, as I'm going to show you on a bunch of, that's not work for me, um, more images. Um, so this is a, a figure taken from the D differential neural computer paper, where um, I think it was one of the first examples where neural network was endowed with this Turing type um, of 
memory, so a tape into which the agent was able to write and from which it was able to read um, by its own choice. And in, in this case, uh, we saw that the, that the um, DNC was making sparse, very sparse, like uh, showing here, super sparse uh, writes and, uh, sorry, super sparse writes and super sparse reads um, throughout the, uh, the entire task that lasted, I don't know, 35 time steps. Um, and I, I think I'm going to skip explaining exactly what this um, algorithm ended up doing, but uh, just to say um, that, that thanks to that sparsity, we were able to um, figure out or reverse engineer what is being put in the memory and what is being read, and uh, in the end, like how the algorithm works. Um, and also, as a, as a side remark, uh, that was, you know, that beautiful figure only um, happened at the end of the project. And when we were doing similar investigations uh, with simpler tasks, we could see that the, uh, the network was um, hacking the solution, so to say. So it would come up with um, a writing and reading mechanism that would just hash one of the possible, possible options in the training set. And we realized that we had to exp expand the training set and throw more difficult tasks at the agent so that the solution we get is generalizable and generally makes sense. This is um, uh, an example, of, uh, sorry, about the resolution. It's like um, been a while ago. Couldn't reproduce that in a finer uh, quality. So that's, uh, that's an image taken from the beautiful Merlin model. Um, a, an agent that was running around a maze and had to, I think, put different objects, pick up uh, certain objects. Um, but basically, it, it had this um, important navigational component, as we're going to see also later in, in the follow-up tasks. And, and this agent, uh, it had like a um, temporal generative um, module inside. So, um, and it also had uh, visual encoders and decoders. And so by just connecting to these modules, we were able to peek into what the agent sees, so to say, and what it believes it's going to see before the actual observation happens, and how much it updates its belief on what kind of environment it's running in. Um, and so, thanks to that visualization, the scientists um, realized that the way the agents um, look or see, perceive the environment is very much different from how we, uh, as humans, see uh, the same frames. So you can see that the, um, you know, just the fact that a painting showed up on the corridor just led to an update of a, like a, a small change of tint in a green wall. Um, and the details of the painting were totally irrelevant for the agent, similarly to the details of all the objects that it was trained to pick up or avoid, like a beautiful guitar, you know, designed by our artists, which is to show up as like a, a bit of gray, ghastly image uh, when, when we decoded the actual, you know, vision of the agent which uh, was like a food for thought. This is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek example where visualization helps to basically turn um, a language of symbols and, and uh, theorems of, and uh, propositions into something that is much more intuitive, actually not too complicated to understand, and um, actually super impressive. This is a new type of a neuron. Uh, a gated linear neuron, and I would heartily encourage you to look into that paper. Um, there are some visualizations there um, to, to read about it. It's, it's a neuron that is universal, and uh, we developed a convex way uh, to learn um, given a convex cost function. All right, moving on with our method. Um, Visualization of the, record, of the activity helped, but we, what we also have in machine learning that we don't have in animals are the gradients. And um, they, as I'm going to show you, can guide our understanding of what kind of algorithms we'll, we're dealing with. Um, so I, I shortly mentioned here that 
Uh, this actually relates to the saliency algorithms. Uh, there's like a big um, bunch of publications about explaining single images or single decisions by uh, usually image classifiers. Um, and they, they offer some alternative to back propagated gradients, but I would say that the improvement is not worth the extra computational cost. And we often are, um, are just good um, looking at the uh, back prop propagated gradients. Um, and those gradients help us uh, formulate hypotheses very often. Um, help us realize what, what is going on in our systems. Um, so, this doesn't show again, but this is the continual learning problem that I mentioned and that Razvan was probably talking about. And uh, just, just to sh quickly recap, the solution was also based on the gradients or the second moment of these gradients. The elastic weight consolidation algorithm would protect the parameters um, that, that showed a large amplitude of the uh, squared gradient during the training. And uh, in this figure, you can see that if, well, we called it uh, Fisher information, although it was like an approximation of Fisher information. Um, and what you see in this picture is that if you perturb the, the weights, the parameters, according to um, the inverse Fisher or the null space of this Fisher, so trying to avoid uh, all the parameters that have posit positive Fisher information, you can um, apply high perturbation uh, to your parameters, and still the uh, agent is able to score, you know, the maximum score. But that, that is to contrast with the uniform uh, perturbation, per sorry, that is to contrast with perturbation applied to all of the parameters, where uh, much quicker you see a drop in the agent's performance. I should make more pauses between these experiments. This is actually another agent, another setup. Uh, one common thing is that it's running through the maze, so it's like a navigationally uh, challenging task. Um, it's a capture the flag game where the agents actually are, apply, are playing in a team against a team of other two agents, and they have to uh, capture the flag of an opponent and bring it back to the base. And it's not easy because the, the, this is a maze. It's complicated to uh, find your way around it. And um, all right, so we visualized the gradients and we realized that uh, a lot of the saliency Im, um, signal uh, happens to be in the place um, which is called the heads um, display, heads on display, I think. Um, and it's an information that stays the same throughout the game. It's an information about what team you're on. And uh, it made us realize that, hey, this information might not be ever um, uh, committed to the many memory systems that this agent was endowed with. And uh, in fact, when we swap the color of that icon, um, during the agent running through the environment. Here it's on the red team, so it's following its friends. They're both happy uh, going with the enemy flag to the base. And when we swap the uh, team assignment, um, the agent starts to tag its, uh, its friend. Um, so yeah, that, that made us question, hey, what, what are these all different memory systems that our agent has at its you know, disposal? Um, doing? Are they helping with the navigation through the maze at all? So that's how we started, um, oh, that's how my next chapter starts. Um, we started dissociating different um, levels of function in, in the, of, of the memory. And um, I already mentioned perturbations in the continual learning uh, paradigm. Ablations and perturbations uh, are our main tools for uh, testing uh, causal relationships and, and testing the function. Uh, oh yeah, that's, that's like a one slide that we uh, follow the Karl Popper scientific method of you know, coming up with a hypothesis, trying not to be too biased and trying not to prove it, but disprove the hypothesis with um, separate experiments that often involve uh, perturbations. 
uh, ablations or even retraining the entire system. And so when we, when we took away the short-term memory from the agent, so we knocked down the LSTM cells um, on, on every time step of the agents playing the game against an intact team, we saw that the, the probability of winning against the team dropped from, I don't know, 40, say 50% to zero. And that was all good, but we next did the same experiment with the long-term memory that was meant to help out with, with the navigation and winning the game, um, finding the flags and finding the way back. And so what you see here is that this, uh, each of the matches lasted 4,500 time steps. And you can see that the memory slack, the long-term memory Turing kind of tape, uh, starts as a blank slack and it fills up um, um, on every time step to, you know, and end up like being totally filled at the end. And so what we did was just to uh, keep that memory blank at every time of, of the game. And uh, for, the, for one of the teams, so for the two agents, we would just wipe out all of its memories and we, it, we would let it play against the intact team. And uh, what we got was agents that were still functional, so they were still able to win about 20% of the games. Which was, which was already surprising. But then we zoomed in onto the, what is actually functionally relevant in all those, all those memories written down um, on that tape. And so in, in the next experiment, um, you might recognize the picture. It's uh, uh, motivated by the Inception movie. Um, we stored the content of um, memories from one team from like a regular game on one maze, and we injected that memory to, or those memories to the team that was made to play again, either on the same maze uh, or on a totally different maze where this memory should not translate. And, and then, you know, we were super surprised to see that uh, having these wrong memories uh, injected in the agents meant that their performance was um, restored to about, you know, nearly 50%. Right? So, so that much we could attribute to actual useful information written down uh, in the memory um, that, you know, the, the agents could capitalize on when running on, this, on the same maze. Uh, all right, so to summarize the method, um, we visualize, for, for generating our hypothesis, we visualize uh, as much as is useful. We visualize behavior that is always useful. Um, we visualize from well-defined functional interpretable modules, and we visualize gradients. And then we, we perform the hypothesis testing by performing lesions, perturbations, and retraining. And um, I'm going to finish early because that's my... Looking at the clock, is it, did it stop? <laughs> do, do I still have... Oh, no, because I didn't start at four. How much time do I have? Tw 20 minutes? Okay, I think we're going to finish early. So I'm going to tell you about the uh, most recent uh, project I've been on, and uh, this is with the science team. And this is actually going to be a small advertisement because um, our company is hiring. So... Um, DeepMind's Deep Mind's mission has always been to solve intelligence and then to use it to solve everything else. That's uh, very nicely said, but as, and, uh, well, since recently we started uh, doing that second part in practice by applying machine learning across uh, many different um, scientific fields. So our main project is protein folding, but we also have nuclear fusion, uh, conservation, electronic structure, chemical synthesis. Um, and the project that, yes, and we're hiring for lots of different places. DeepMind is now uh, all across the world. So if you're interested, um, I don't know, contact the team. Um, so yes, analysis um, is crucial in the science effort because, you know, machines can learn for us, they can achieve better predictions, but how much um, does it bring to the field of science? So can we push the frontiers of science by learning from our machines? 
And that, that is still a very much open question. So if you have ideas, we need, um, we need people getting excited about the analysis and about analysis in science. And we need theoreticians and um, we need more ideas. But to sum up my talk and sum up my uh, methods, I'm going to tell you about the uh, glass dynamics project I've been working on, where the task is to predict um, an average mobility of every particle in a glass. So a glass is here represented as a um, kind of an ideal gas, a mixture of two types of particles. And um, by running um, Newton equations, like exhaustive computational simulations, we uh, have a bunch of data where we have like an initial um, state of, of the glass, of all the particles and their positions. And then uh, we have at different times, uh, you know, the, the average positions of how far the particles moved. And then we unleash a graph network on, uh, on that problem to predict from the static structure of, of the glass particles, their three-dimensional arrangement, uh, the mobility, so called mobility of the particles. And um, so this is an example of how, how visualization uh, can help to tell the story. And uh, you can see that uh, what you see here is like a two-dimensional projection of the encoding taken from the graph nodes. And um, here in this graph net, every graph node corresponds to one particle in our uh, glassy system. And so uh, coded with color, you have the target mobility of these particles. And you have um, here two color maps because they were, as I said, it was a mixture of two uh, types of particles. And so the smaller B particles are um, drawn in gray because they were actually not uh, part of the training data. We trained the, the system on the, on the bigger, more numerous um, A particles. And so what you can see here is that every step of the recurrent computation um, of that graph net. And um, the encoding starts in two separate points, basically, because the initial information fed on the graph uh, network, on the graph nodes, is just the, the type of the particle uh, that a given node is representing. And you can see that already after one recurrent step, um, the network combines information. So the information fed on the nodes is about the particle type, but there's also the edges, and the information about the edges encodes the relative positions of the particles. And so that, uh, that information flowing through the network on a single time step already um, causes the um, encoding to diversify. But as you can see, the uh, clustering of the, of the encoding of the activity um, that corresponds to the particle type is kept throughout the uh, computation, the entire computation. And you can see that, you know, initially the, um, the colors are like salt and pepper um, all mixed up together and, whoa, oh no, I spent too much on a single slide, I'm sorry for that. Um, okay, that worked. Um, all right. And uh, as, as the computation progresses, um, the encoding we call becomes more linearly sep um, separable. So it's easy to decode from this type of encoding. And um, if, if you look carefully enough, you might realize through that visualization that the uh, mobility of the particles that a network was never trained on, I mean, the graph net represented it, but you know, the target or the mobil their mobility didn't go into the cost function, it, the network still learned that mobility, seemingly probably helped in um, predicting the mobility of the A particles. And so in terms of other tools, um, visualizing the gradients um, dur during this project um, helped us realize that some of the features that we were initially feeding into the graph net were useless. Uh, the, the gradients were so low that when we took away those features, uh, we realized that actually improves the training. And then we performed a series of perturbations and ablation studies that informed us about the typical length that matters for the prediction, so something that physicists um, cared very deeply about. And uh, it, it helped us realize um, or differentiate 
uh, between uh, the, the different time scales of the problem. So we uh, trained a separate network for, for each of the time scales and realized, we realized that for the shortest time scales, the exact positions of the neighboring cells were, uh, were important and useful for the prediction. But uh, when we looked uh, and like at very, very long time scales, um, like local density or the uh, one-dimensional distances rather than exact positions, it was all the information that was needed for the prediction. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up my talk and let you go early. Um, I hope by now I'm, I convinced you that understanding and explaining is a hard and a very important problem. Um, every case is special and needs its own hypothesis. And we do have out-of-the-box uh, tools like neuroscience, but they can reveal correlations, uh, but not causal relationships so far. Um, we need separate tests uh, to establish what, what is actually functionally relevant. And we, we need the, the human in the loop to basically understand what the problem is and what kind of solutions are possible and what to test for. Uh, so, A, we need more of them. You heard about that in my advertisement uh, slide. But, B, we need more theoreticians to maybe come up with more uh, intricate tools and maybe some ways of automating this. Um, so, understanding is not only important for debugging, but also to increase trust in our machines. Um, it's, a, it's important for the uh, AI safety. And um, it's, you know, it's used in our team to basically make sure that we are on track in terms of, you know, our goal achieving the artificial general intelligence. Because, you know, um, every time you look, every system we've looked at so far uh, um, turns out to take dirty shortcuts. Like every time. Um, I mean, as soon as the network is allowed, it, it will just go for the easiest possible solution. But we want, what, what we want to achieve is a general system that is able to reason uh, and apply that knowledge to new tasks. And uh, in order to get there, we must know where we are, where are the systems that we've already achieved. And, and then this super important and fun topic of learning from our machines. So we already learned from AlphaChess and uh, AlphaGo uh, by basically having professionals, um, chess professionals, analyzing like what kind of moves uh, this, our AlphaChess system recommends. Um, and yes, we do have that machine learning in science with its many interesting uh, questions and, um, you know, questions about the solutions that we get with the systems. And with that, I'm going to finish my talk and thank uh, um, my team and all the people that I, um, whose research I mentioned in my slides. And of course, uh, thanks to all of you for bearing with me.